have you ever posted something on social media and then thought, that was dumb, and took it down? I did. That happened on January 11th. And I thought, whoa, do I really want to tell the whole world from the guy that I dated in high school to the lady that I met last week that I had been sexually molested as a child? Not really. And yes, I saw you squirm in your chair. Here's the thing. I awoke to a friend asking me, why did you take that down? I wanted to share it. Yeah, that's pretty much why I took it down. <laughs> Didn't want to share that. But I shared it with my husband. He said, I need to be posted. And that nagging voice said, post it. I did. Within minutes, my Facebook feed, my phone, Messenger was blowing up. The post I wanted to hide went a little crazy. Within 12 hours of the, from the original posting, I was offered a publishing deal. I accepted amid feelings of, oh my, and oh my. No one wants to talk about sexual abuse. It's a little secret. It's dirty that we hide away. I sure didn't. And I'm a professional speaker. I'm comfortable talking. But if I'm not comfortable talking, then who else would be? The angry voices did not connect with me. They did not describe me. And I have something to say. I am not the only one affected by sexual abuse. In 2016, I was contracted to speak in Indonesia. After two days of work, my hosts wanted to show me their country, and I was willing to be pampered. I was enjoying every minute of it. Their beautiful country, um, all the luxury, and then we were going through a section of Bali, and I'd just been told that it was a rough part of town. I was a little surprised to see a young man holding his sister protectively by the arms, and his even younger brother by the hand, attempting to cross a busy street. And I looked on this from my perspective, high up in a luxury SUV, and I said, where is their mother? My host shifted their gaze, and I realized my blunder too late. As we drove by, and my eyes met his through my tinted windows, his pain was evident. No social worker to intervene, no charities available. Of course, those that were were overrun with a demand that outpaces their capacity to give. Had I been just a little bit less judgmental in that moment, just a little bit, I could have rolled down the window and handed them a bag of food that sat right next to me. Would it have changed the facts that were explained that these children were probably orphaned or abandoned? Would it have changed that probably all of them would end up in the sex trade? My judgment of them says more about me than it does about them. As it is with each of us, we judge victims of the sex trade, sexual assault, or molestation. I judged because it was outside of my frame of reference. I judged because it wasn't my everyday experience. Where I live in a nearly picture-perfect suburb, much like the one I grew up in, we don't often see children unaccompanied in rough parts of town, and I'm not often in part rough parts of town. It wasn't my everyday experience, so I judged. We all do it. We hear of a disaster in a far off country like a tsunami. And we feel bad and we will run or write a check. We feel bad, we pray for them. Yet some of us can be heard to say, well, they shouldn't have been living there. After all, tsunamis are bound to happen. <sighs> You've seen the disaster movies. I have too, right? We judge because it's not our everyday experience. Sexual assault, rape, molestation, it's not a comfortable thing to talk about. We judge because we want to hide it. We want to console ourselves. We want to distance ourselves from the likelihood of that happening to us, that that unthinkable event couldn't really be us. Victim blaming is all the rage. So much more comfortable to blame the victim than to realize that we too are at risk. We say, oh, well she shouldn't have been dressed that way. Oh, they shouldn't have been drinking. So every time we dress in a certain way, it's okay if we're raped. 
And every time we drink, it's okay if we're assaulted. We don't live where tsunamis happen. Check, we are safe. We don't dress in a skirt that short. Check, we are safe. We don't drink or we drink responsibly. Check, we are safe. In judging the victim, we mentally distance ourselves, making them not only not human, but not us. In the 2015 rape case of Stanford, we all heard the debate as a society that the, victim, the perpetrator was not really to blame because, you know, he'd had too much to drink. And as the victim was intoxicated, not fully aware of what was happening to her, she was being raped behind a dumpster, was it really that bad? Yes, it was, because she had not given consent. One in three girls and one in five boys have experienced a sexual act without their consent. When we hear about an assault, we cannot distance ourselves saying, oh, this could never happen to me, because that is our reality. That is our experience. In my case, I was groomed to accept the molestation. I maintained his secret as though it were my own. I covered up for him. I'd been brainwashed by a man who'd come into my life when I was around two years old. At 14, I was able to free myself of this man. Some in my family said, well, it's her flirtatious nature. You know how she is. Or they blamed my taste, they questioned my taste in men for years. Victim blaming. However, I have chosen to evolve beyond that. I am more than what happened to me. We have a culture that tells people that they are not okay because something has happened to them, that they are broken and damaged goods. However, we are more than what happens to us. I'm a witness of that. We all have a voice within each of us. There is that voice that tells us the truth. With my children, I want to raise children that respect themselves because they respect others. We deceive ourselves by thinking we have superior mental processes. That is not only a form of judgment, it is a mental game that we play. We judge the victim and we fail to see that there's a person there. Myself and millions others are a shocking statistic that takes sexual assault from a fringe happening to almost a common occurrence. Yet if sexual assault is so common, then why is there such a stigma to talk about it? Why are we made to feel as the victim shamed or blamed? Doesn't that connotate that it was our responsibility? Ooh, that feels sticky, right? A hundred percent of rape, sexual assault and molestation is a hundred percent the fault of the, the perpetrator, not the victim, 100% the assailant. Even if he or she were dressed provocatively, was um, flirtatious, was under the influence of a substance, or in love with the assailant, it is 100% the fault of the perpetrator, not the victim. Why in a culture that discourages open communication, blames the victim, and would just prefer it all go away, why is myself and so many others now speaking out against sexual abuse? To change the conversation. We have told our children to fear strangers when in reality 80% of those molested are molested by somebody they knew. We're also telling young victims by our bitterness that they will always hurt. I do not believe this to be true. Let me be clear. That does not release the man that chose to violate my innocence from his crime or the evil of his act. However, I have chosen to evolve beyond a scared and manipulated child. I have chosen to grow beyond being a traumatized teen. I have an amazing life. And that has nothing to do with him. I like me. You'll notice that I do not refer to him as my abuser. Because my implies ownership and he does not own me. 
I have, I'm a joyful and confident woman. I'm in a loving marriage with amazing, sensitive, and loving children. I tell my children when they were little and they were having a fight, and I would say, well, how do you feel? We get right down in there, we talk to them. How do you feel? And I get an answer like, well, child of mine, that feeling is telling you to stop what is happening and to leave. They thought I was teaching them how not to fight. I was. But I was also teaching them to honor that voice, that warning beacon that each of us have. That warning beacon will not only guide us to the light, it will also guide us to the darkness. Excuse me. Whoa, let's be clear. <laughs> not guide us to the darkness, guide us away from the darkness and warn us. I want to raise children that unlike what I was told, I was told by the man that molested me to squelch that feeling. I was taught, as you were taught, to not say anything if you can't say something nice. Saying, stop, don't, my body, are not nice statements. My sweet daughter, when she was two and a half years old, we were at a large gathering of people and I heard her go, ah! I looked over to see a man holding her by the arm. He wanted to hug her. She was resisting. There was an assembled group of people, and I walked over to them. Now, my daughter is a total cuddle bug. She loves to be touched and held. But her inner voice was saying this was not someone she wanted to be hugged by. I walked over to them, and I explained to them that my daughter had the right to hug whom she wanted or not. I want to teach my children to honor that voice of truth that each of us have. We are teaching our children to squelch that feeling. We are all told to squelch that, to not listen to that voice that will guide us, but it will. Should my son, daughter, niece, nephew, or neighbor kid experience the horrors that I did, I would tell them this, is 100% the fault of the molester, not you. 100% their fault. But yet, just if you're walking innocently down the sidewalk and you're hit by a car, it is not up to the driver to decide when the ambulance is called. It is not up to the assembled witnesses to decide when you are okay. You will have to do that. If your attacker is caught, if the attacker gives you, don't ask your attacker to give you permission. Don't seek that validation because they won't. You will have to decide. You will have to do the brutally hard work to repair your broken self. Is that fair? No, it is not. But it's your life and your body and no one else can do this for you. Healing is not about getting permission. Healing is about taking your recovery away from those that would hurt you, taking your power away from those, taking them out of your thoughts, out of your actions, out of your life, becoming you without them. Only then can we transition from being victims to survivors. As survivors, we need to talk about what happened. Can I propose to those of you who have not been affected by sexual abuse or molestation, perhaps you've been a victim of relationship pain, health problems. We do not deserve a lecture on what we could have done better, just as you don't deserve a lecture on how you could eat better or interact with others. We all have our things that make us hurt. We all have the things that are hard. See, we don't often introduce ourselves by traumatic events, like, hi, I had a colonoscopy yesterday. How are you? <laughs> the problem with placing millions of us, of us in a box labeled victim and permanent marker carries this danger. We can read. And we might just believe you. We are more than the events of our lives, no matter how hideous those events are. We are more than that. Those that have been victimized can 
and should move beyond victimization. This is why I'm speaking. I'm your neighbor. I'm the kid down the street. I'm a woman that's more than the events of my life. I promise you, that pain that you feel, it will take time. It will get better. It will be something you don't always think about. And when you get there, you'll become an advocate. An advocate is somebody who has been there, overcame, and lifts others up. To the victim, you are worth being fought for. To the survivor, you are worth the work to fight for your healing. And to society, those of you who can put aside judgment and become honorary advocates for the abused and those at risk of being abused, will you join in the fight to protect the innocent? Thank you.